I'm David S. Dawson from The Intellectual Podcast, a show that spotlights creatives from all walks of life. Part of the Gunna Geek Network, just like the show you're checking out now. Shows on the network are individually owned, and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other incredibly geeky shows at GunnaGeekNetwork.com. Welcome to episode 252 of Better Podcasting. On this show, we discuss how podcasting is ageless. In this week's Better Podcasting Download, we take better podcasting out clubbing. And finally, in this week's Better Podback, we look at the Discord Better Podcasting Grab Bag. Lauren, start the show now. Nobody wants to think about me going out clubbing. Nope. No. Welcome to Better Podcasting. With a combined history of over a thousand episodes and starting as early as 2008, we are hobby podcasters through and through, just like you. That's why we are different. We minimize the money talk so that you can focus on building a better podcast. Here are the hosts for the show, Stephen John Drew and Stargate Pioneer. Welcome to episode 252 of Better Podcasting. I am Stephen, and with me, of course, is the better SP. I'm better because I finally, after two months, I finally have an oven, a range, it's operating, and it has an air fryer in it. So this is the better SP because he can now be better fed. <laughs> hey, if you want to talk about his oven and his range and his other things that he just listed you should come over to our discord server we have a discord community it's a great community lots of people talking about podcasting and other techie things like that you can come to betterpodcasting.com slash discord that's d-i-s-c-o-r-d we'd love to have you over there and if you want to watch us record this show live we do it on tuesdays at 5 p.m pacific that's 8 p.m eastern unless you know somebody's late. Uh, but if we're not recording this show, we do record our companion show, The Better Podcasting Live Chat. We alternate between those every week. And hey, we might be going to a method that maybe you'd be able to communicate with us during the live streams through our Discord. So check it out at betterpodcasting.com slash Discord. We would love to see you over there. And by the way, while you're there, if you want, send us a How I Saved My Podcast story. If something went wrong, with said podcast, well, your podcast, and you want to tell us how you fixed it, let us know over there. We would love to share that in a future episode. SP, did I get all the plugs? You, know, you got most of them. I was just going to say the one great thing about podcasting is it doesn't really matter if you're late with a live stream because the people afterwards don't care. They don't know. They don't notice. The actual show gets produced on time, mm -hmm. and nobody is the wiser of the show being late or, or not. So the only people that would know is the people that show up in the live recording. And if you don't record live, then nobody knows that you started late. So it's a good way to save your podcast. But they do know when you are late publishing Better Podcasting live chat, which I uh, totally did this week because I just forgot. So uh, check that out and get chat with us over there about that at betterpodcasting.com slash discord. I'm sure Damien will join you in giving me a hard time about that. Everybody likes giving Steven a hard time. If you've ever come by one of those recording sessions that we just mentioned, you might see a variety of different people in different points of their lives in our chat room. While there are people who join us live while we record that are in a similar age group as us, we also have people who are much wiser than us, perhaps enjoying retirement. We also have people in there that are in their early adulthood as well, by the way, wiser than us. And we've even had people listen and watch us who are in their teenage years and probably truthfully far wiser than us as well. They just haven't lost all the brain cells yet that I have. <laughs> Heck, even the two of us, here, although we like to associate ourselves in the same age demographic, we are in different points in our lives 
with one of us, me, having young children, and the other having young grand puppies. That's one of the great things about hobby podcasting. <laughs> Yeah, I guess I was going to say just one grand puppy, but there are two grand puppies. They just came at different times and we're dealing with a grand puppy right now. Uh, But that is one of the great things about hobby podcasting. It spans a variety of different age demographics and we all share the same thing, which is a great passion for podcasting. Today, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the different age of podcasters, the pros and the cons of different ages as you podcast. And some things that you might have to consider at any stage of your life while podcasting. So let's begin with an important question. Why does it even matter to consider the different ages of podcasting? Well, let's start then with one of the things that we often talk about when we are giving what we believe is good advice for hobby podcasters. And that's setting realistic expectations to do with your hobby while everybody does live very unique lives, and every individual has their own set of advantages and challenges in their lives, it's hard to deny that as people go through their lives, generally, they go through different stages that have certain things that relate to other people in that same age category. And if you recognize what stage you are in your life as far as age goes, you might be able to help set yourself more realistic expectations when thinking about your hobby podcasting endeavors. Here's an example. Let's say that there's a college student in the middle of a full semester working a part-time job. They really should probably expect to have less time to podcast than somebody who might be living the retired life, making their podcast endeavors really a key part of their day-in and day-out entertainment. Maybe that's their main focus in their retired life. As well, somebody who is in their 30s with a family that is growing might have more schedule conflicts than, say, somebody who's in their 50s that is a fresh, empty nester. Yeah, we're talking about ourselves here, by the way. Yeah, a little bit. And if you uh, get who is in which demographic, then you know which one of us is which there. Anyway, another reason that we think it's important is because, in general, people have different experiences and possibly different views based on where they are in life. Recognizing these differences can be important to help you take an authentic approach to your podcast. As an example, over on the Good Geek Show, we often struggle to understand some of the latest tech advancements that are targeted for a younger demographic. That's just because we don't connect with them. However, somebody younger than us who is in that demographic might think we sound like a bunch of grumpy old men because we can't understand the need for these advancements. And I hate to admit it, Stephen. But I'm thinking of my parents not being able to program the VCR. I am now at that age where I might not be able to program a VCR if I hadn't done it 30 years ago. I'm thinking of tearing down my podcast studio, just getting a wooden rocker and just podcasting from my porch so I can yell at the kids to get off my lawn. Interesting that you should say that I had to take a detour last weekend because of road construction and I was taken through some small towns and there was literally a guy just rocking back and forth in his rocking chair on his front porch, watching the traffic go by. And I was thinking, man, give that guy a microphone and the stories he'd be able to tell. That would be awesome. So there's an example, right? An old retired guy just watching the traffic by. Good podcast, right? But this doesn't make either of our opinions wrong because of our age differences. There's probably a target audience for both of these points of view over on the Good Geek Show. Without recognizing the differences in our lives, one of these situations where we're old fuddy-duddies and old guys that don't recognize the need for change in technology might be tempted to think that they were misguided and keep their opinions to themselves. But there's probably an audience who shares that same point of view, perhaps in the same demographic. Which takes us to our next point. We think that you should draw on your real-life experiences to help create content. For example, a spry 20-year-old might have more energy to podcast than so many of us older podcasters that wish that uh, we had, instead of falling asleep at eight at night in the middle of creating our show notes, we actually had the energy of a 20-year-old to podcast. Or, you know, falling asleep while you're getting ready to publish better podcasting live chat, and then you forget, and then you just don't do it till the Monday. <laughs> you just don't click the <laughs> button, you fall asleep. I've, I've actually done that before with Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. 
However, this 20 year old that we're talking about might not have the same life experience to draw from when it comes to creating content. And as such, it might make the process of creating material harder. For example, they might have to do a lot more research to find relatable content or knowledge about the content. However, somebody with more life experience, say like myself, might have personal experience that I can draw from to connect to the listeners. I'll just give a real life example that I ran into last weekend. I went up to visit my family up at the lake. My son happened to be there. He's having some problems with his truck and it was overheating. So I asked him, well, is there coolant in there? And he said, yes, even though there wasn't, but let's get beyond that. So the next thing I said was, well, maybe it's the thermostat. And he says, it's not the thermostat. It was reading just fine in the truck. And I was like, well, do you understand what a thermostat is? And he says, dad, I'm a chemical engineer. I know what a thermostat is. Only a day later did we find out that he did not understand what a thermostat does in a gasoline combustion engine with coolant. It is literally a valve that opens when it heats up so that it lets the coolant into the engine block, thus cooling the engine. He thought it was actually a temperature gauge. So that's just an example of knowledge or experience that I've gained over the years after rebuilding engines. I know what a thermostat is. He did not. Great example, SP. And it kind of takes us to our next point, which is that we do think that you should recognize that age gaps and speaking to age gaps can possibly benefit your podcast. And this is because as we all go through life, there tends to be sort of a natural draw to people sort of in your own age group. Let's explain this for a minute. We grow up with our peers being our own age throughout our school years. Then sometimes that transitions into the workforce where people who are fresh out of school find themselves in similar points in their careers as people that are their own age. Now, as we go through our careers, that might vary a little bit, and you might find that there does end up being a bit of a distance with your peers. But the wonderful thing of retirement is that it brings that all back together because often there are sort of mandated or regulated retirement ages, and that kind of brings back that age group again because people who are starting their retirement years tend to all be sort of in that same age demographic. So this is something that kind of goes through all of our lives is sort of this uh, draw to people your own age group. But here's the thing with podcasting, we would encourage you to throw that out the window and think about the fact that podcasting doesn't need to just be around your own age group. As we mentioned earlier, both of us are in different points in our lives. And through better podcasting, we actually regularly interact with people that are maybe quite a bit older than us and quite a bit younger than us. And many of these people have even contributed content to our shows through things like voice clips, guest appearances, emails, and even on the Better Podcasting live chat, live chat questions. Here's the thing about all of this. It's a great example on how sticking with your own age group doesn't matter with podcasting because all of this has added value to better podcasting episodes when this feedback and this input is put into the show from a bunch of different age groups. And having a variety of ages on your podcast can really offer a variety of different experiences for your listeners to connect with and can help you appeal possibly to a broader listener base. I know, SP, you do a show called Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. and, and that's about a television show. And I think that TV shows are a great example on where this sort of difference can make a big difference when it comes to podcasting, right? Right. So a lot of times modern TV shows will be influenced somewhere along the run by the TV of yesteryear, we'll call it, right? The TV that's from 20, 30, 40 years ago. Sometimes it's something as simple as a tonal similarity. Sometimes it's paying obvious homage to something. And sometimes it's a flat out reboot. Okay. Maybe in the year 2021, a lot of times it's a flat out reboot, but we digress. Let's say you want to do a podcast on the current CBS television series, Magnum P.I. Unless you're somebody who goes back and watches older TV series, there's a certain age where you may not have ever seen the original Magnum P.I. And further, if you were born after, say, 1988, then you definitely did not see the original when it was originally on air. A podcast that is hosted by somebody younger who has had no exposure to the original Magnum P.I., co-hosted by somebody who watched the original Magnum P.I. when it was live on the air back in the 70s and 80s, might offer two really interesting viewpoints on the current Magnum P.I. series. 
Not to mention the constant references to the iconic Tom Selleck mustache. Which I think, if you didn't know this, SP said he's going to start growing that uh, coming this year. I will. It will be after my daughter's wedding in October. So the bearded SP is coming back later this year, which does inherently include the mustache. But another way you can think you can leverage your age in your podcast is by recognizing that there might be a different age group than your own that would be better suited to speak on a certain element of your podcast about certain subjects that can help add authenticity. Now, what were we talking about? We got an example to cover you here. Let's say you're doing a podcast that needs to chronicle a certain point in history. You have a family member that lived in this history, say somebody that lived through the Great Depression or World War II or Vietnam or some of the political upheavals of the 60s and 70s. If your show allows it, getting those family members who lived through it to speak about living through the history can help the listener understand better what it was like during that time rather than you simply doing research to provide secondhand accounts. Conversely, you might be doing a podcast where it's a topic that you need somebody going through it right now to speak better on the topics. Uh, Let's say, for example, unfortunately, neither of us are in this case right now, but you're doing a podcast episode about the first time house buying, but you've been a homeowner since the 80s. Okay, Stephen, that was a dig at me. (laughs) Well, things are very different today in the world of house buying, so your experience might not be fully translatable to people who are going through first-time house purchasing right now in 2021. Why? So housing codes are different today. Back then, you had asbestos, you had stuccos, and today you have earthquake and hurricane codes that are different than they were in the past. The options in the house to consider are different. For example, today you have Ethernet-enabled homes versus telephone wire, which was big back in the day. You might even have a house that has green energy production integrated into it versus just the standard gas and electric hookup to big uh, conglomerates. And you might have security cameras and a surveillance system versus the standard intercom systems that were prevalent in the 80s, et cetera, et cetera. So there's just differences in the options of the home. Let's talk about financing. It's a little bit different today than it was in the 80s. First of all, interest rates were much higher in the 1980s than they are today. There's more available lenders today than there were in the 80s. And there's more information on buying without a realtor that's just easily acceptable, accessible because the internet is there than there were in the 1980s. So perhaps you can bring somebody on your podcast who recently went through this process. Like, Stephen, you could bring your brother on or... I could bring my kids on if they were buying a house or something like that. And maybe somebody who has experience over the decades to contrast. So that would be us in this particular case. But you'd have that. I'm doing this today. I've done this before. And maybe some experience along the way. It would make an interesting episode of buying your first house in 2021. Now, the next point that we want to talk about right now is that it's all to do with developing your podcast. On Better Podcasting, we do talk from time to time about how we think that it's beneficial to regularly solicit feedback for your podcast so that you can uh, get objective opinions on where your strengths and your opportunities lay in your podcast. It can sometimes be hard for you to figure that out on your own, so soliciting these feedback can make a big difference. We encourage this right from new podcasts to well-established podcasts. This feedback is invaluable. When you're going through these various review cycles, unless it's a very hyper-specific demographic, we would really encourage you to get people of various age groups to be a part of this process because they may be able to help provide you feedback from various points of views, from various different life experiences. This is because there are different life experiences that might make certain things come off differently when a listener is hearing your podcast, depending on where they are in their lives or what experiences they've had. We'll come back to this, though, a little bit later. Another thing that we want to mention in a bit different light is that age might dictate the format or the length of your podcast. Right. So a podcast hosted by or for eight-year-olds will inherently need to be shorter than a podcast hosted by 30-year-olds. Now, why is this? This is because attention spans are shorter for eight-year-olds in general, right? An eight-year-old audience, their ability to comprehend content 
is less than adults, so you kind of have to simplify it down. And recording time for eight-year-olds, if they're actually hosting the show, is going to be a lot less than 30-year-olds. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Not to mention your release schedule for your show might be limited to just a short series. You know, you, you back a bunch of recordings so that you can have a season to release or maybe just do one show a month just to get the content to record because eight-year-olds, they don't have that much to say for podcasts in general. So you're going to have to make those concessions. So age is a factor in the format of the show right there. And also, don't forget about the legalities of podcasting with an underage minor. There are privacy concerns. You have to get a parent or a guardian to give permission. So that's a legal issue right there. And all the same issues apply that normally apply to adults like slander or libel. Kids might not realize what they're saying. So you have to monitor that. So while podcasting with your kids or somebody else's kids or maybe your class at school is amazing and often cute, protecting the children legally should be your first priority. All right, now let's move on to some some cautions that we think you should have when it comes to considering age and your podcasting. We think it's important that you consider that your life experiences is not the life experience that everybody else has. We kind of alluded to that a little bit earlier, but it goes to both ends of the spectrum on this. As we said earlier, we think it's fair to say that as people age older, they generally have more experiences, and this means that they have more to draw on. However, it's important that you should consider that people grow up in different times. For example, this means that people who are children right now have different experiences than when you were a child. That means that your experience may not translate one-to-one with people who are younger than you right now. For example, SP and I both, we could talk all day about our experiences with burning CDs. However, there's probably at least one listener right now listening to Better Podcasting that thinks we're literally talking about setting CDs on fire. No, for those listeners, burning CDs was a term that we used back when we were writing CDs. On the flip side, it's important to keep in mind that if you don't have a lot of life experience, you might not have the same experiences to draw on to see something from a different point of view. Because your audience likely covers a variety of different age demographics, we think it's important that you remember this when you are creating your content. But here's the big caution. We're not saying you should change your point of view, but you should at least consider how things could be received by somebody in a different age demographic than you. Here's an example of what we're talking about. If you're using a bunch of young, trendy language, there might be a section of your audience that doesn't understand that. Conversely, those young whippersnappers might not understand what a whippersnapper even is when you tell them all about your eight-track tape deck. And this is the point that we think that you should really pay attention to, is that be aware of some of these age differences, especially when it comes to language that was popular back when you were a kid versus maybe popular with kids these days. You might have to give a bit of a backstory on an experience that you had to help share that opinion and make it connect with all of your listeners, or you might have to do a little bit of a translation. For those of you who are sitting there wondering, what is this 8-track? Well, for for your reference, an 8-track predated a cassette tape. And for those of you also wondering, a cassette tape predated the CD. And for those of you also wondering, a CD predated an MP3 file. And these were all used, all of these things were physical things that would play music. And for all of you wondering as well, an MP3 file used to not just be for podcasts, it was for playing music. So you get the idea. Sometimes you might have to explain things depending on the language that you're using and the demographics that you have for your podcast. Steven, I think it's time you need to turn the page on this. (laughs) Another caution that we have is considering how podcasting advice might relate to where you fall in the age demographics. For example, let's say you want to learn audio editing. If you're able to find tutorials hosted by somebody sort of in your age demographic, you might find that they come at the content with similar experience and pacing that lines up with your desired experience. There were people before we started podcasting that had never used computers that came to use the computers to edit. And believe it or not, we can come full circle. There are people today that have never used a computer and have problems using a computer to audio 
edit. So if you find somebody coming from one of those perspectives, either really old or really young, then you might be coming at it in a manner that you can learn audio editing better. The next caution that we want to mention is that we think you should be aware of, generally speaking, age can affect your physical condition. For example, a spry 20-year-old might be able to sit or stand for hours on end, recording episode after episode, batch recording a podcast. But for some of us, it might be a little harder to sit or stand in a long sitting before we need to get up and creak our bones and move around. Dang those millies. In this situation, two different age podcasters might have to approach the idea of batch recording a podcast differently. Of course, we should point out that age does not always define physical condition as there are people who are in better physical shape than either of us who have many years on us. And then there's the people who don't, they're not as fortunate as us and have physical conditions that confine them to such things like wheelchairs. And they have to deal with that their entire lives, including podcasting. So the last caution we have is one that we think is arguably the most important one. Do not let your age determine whether or not you should podcast or how you should podcast. Although today we've talked a lot about some generalization regarding age, we'd be totally remiss if we didn't point out that there are a lot of people that break the mold when it comes to age-based activities. For example, there are some people that aim to take early retirement, and there are others that take up a part-time job deep into the retirement, not for financial reasons, but just because they need the activity in their life. They need to get up. They need to get out. They need an interface with life, so they decide to get a part-time job to do that. There are people who skydive in their teen years, and yet, Stephen tells me in July of 2020, there was a 103-year-old man who set the Guinness Book of World Records for being the oldest person to skydive. Stephen, that was not me. <laughs> well, give yourself a couple more years and I'm sure you could break that record. <laughs> Just a couple, right? There are also adults who were podcasting well before they had kids that are now actually doing podcasts with their kids. It's a great example on how the age demographic doesn't really matter. There are people who are podcast mentoring somebody younger than them right now. And conversely, there are people that are podcast mentoring someone that's older than them. Again, doesn't matter. And there are people who are tech whizzes across all age groups. And there are people who are tech shy across all age groups as well. So again, it doesn't necessarily boil down to age. It doesn't matter what age you are. If you have the drive to podcast, we know you can do it. Heck, we think that we should really double tap on an earlier point that we made and really highlight that each person has a personal relationship through podcasting that they might not have had otherwise. And for us personally, this has happened through multiple different age gaps. Podcasting spans really a variety of different ages. So you shouldn't let any generalization define what you can or cannot do for podcasting. In the end, just make sure that you're having fun. So draw on that personal experience to speak from an authentic position and try to learn from other people who might have a different point of view in their life as you embark on your different podcast endeavors, whether they are older than you or younger than you. Podcasting is an ageless pastime, much like bowling, fishing, or reading. Nearly any age a person can podcast. And then keeping in mind the pros and cons and cautions of each age group that we went over and many others out there, while podcasting can set your show up for success in the long run. As hobby podcasters, that's what we're striving to do to make our shows better, better podcasting. And at the very least, keeping your show age appropriate will help lead to a better podcast that is more fun for you and for your audience to listen to. Just don't ask us to burn a CD with this podcast on it. It's not going to happen. This is the Better Podcasting Download. All right, SP, you're the one that tells me I'm going clubbing today. Uh, Please tell me, why am I going clubbing? Well, because you live close to Vancouver and there's a lot of clubs in Vancouver, I heard. So, yeah. So what are we talking about clubbing? Well, I ran across this article on Forbes.com 
It was written by uh, John Brandon, and the title was The Drop-In Audio App, Clubhouse is Dying. It was fun while it lasted. And this is interesting to me. We haven't really talked about Clubhouse quite a bit on this show because neither of us knew it would be around for a while. We wanted to make sure that we weren't sending our audience in a frenzy to someplace that might dry up in in a little bit. So we had concerns. And a lot of those concerns can go back to the very beginning of this podcast when we were big on Blab. Blab was a software, an app that allowed people to connect up to four people video wise, and they had an active chat room. It, it was very capable. It had its issues, but it brought a lot of podcasters together, but it lived less than a year. So we took this look at Clubhouse, like, okay, why is Clubhouse being successful? Is it because of the pandemic? Is it because of the technology is at the point where people are actually clamoring for it? No pun intended there, by the way. Or is this because it is just a flash in the pan sort of thing, right? Yeah, you know, people, it, it was at that time of year. It doesn't matter if there was a pandemic or not. You know, it, it, people were inside in, in Northern America and, and Europe. It was still winter time. So why is that why Clubhouse really gained a foothold? So we were like, I want to understand this a little bit more before we bring it on here. Now, I'm not going to say that this article was well enough researched and had enough data points to say that this point of view is valid. However, this kind of highlights our concerns. And because it highlighted our concerns, I just wanted to bring it forward. The title again was the drop-in audio app Clubhouse is dying. It was fun while it lasted. If you read the article, you go into the fact that the author had successfully used just a few months ago, used Clubhouse to be able to have seminars, to talk about his experience in writing a ton of blog posts, and actually had dozens of people, perhaps hundreds of people in some cases, he said, come into his Clubhouse and, and, and were listening. Now, recently in the past couple of weeks, crickets. All right. Why is that? So he went into a bunch of rationales, like people that he knew were on clubhouse before are not on clubhouse. Now, uh, goes into the fact of, uh, weather is opening up, uh, pandemic is lightning. It's still out there, but it's lightning. So people are like, okay, well, I'm going to meet these people in person, even if I have to maintain social distancing and if I have to wear masks. That's my commentary. So I have a few thoughts here. Steven, do you want to go first or you want me to run through my thoughts? Uh, I'll just quickly start it off here by saying that I think that this this does speak to a larger point is that maybe it was a flash in the pan, like you said. And, and that could be for a couple of reasons. Number one, all of those things you just said. But number two, I think that it was an experiment and people have a, a fear of missing out. And that's probably what drove it at first because people started to talk about Clubhouse. And then there were other things that came like Twitter and Discord sort of getting into that where maybe people already were. And so I think that um, they might have also been a little too late when it came to the Android side of things. Now, the other the other side of uh, of this that I want to mention is I, I actually don't think it is far enough along to call it dead. I, I think that there's still people talking about it. I think in some of the circles that our audience um, goes in with podcasting and things like that, I think that maybe it, it's quieted down, but I think that there are other clubhouse uh, things that are still happening. But I think it's right in that right in that moment where we'll see either a resurgence or then it will officially kind of just go away. I, I don't think it's it's far enough along to call it in this in exactly as this article is referring to it as which is basically gone yeah i think for the article's sake i think the author is saying yeah, i'm not getting a return on investment anymore so i'm, I'm not going to put any more time into it and that's kind of what we were worried about by saying hey hobby podcaster why don't you use clubhouse so what is clubhouse let's just very briefly do that it was an app for a while it was only on ios as steven mentioned it's on Android now, and it was an audio only app that you can invite people into rooms and that you can basically have a mini classroom session or a club or a podcast. And they're kind of late in the game to embrace podcasting techniques such as recording and, and making sure it was legal or OK with people that you invite up to the stage to be able to record and that sort of thing. So that's what Clubhouse was or it still is. But it is. It not um, I, I, I'm not going to be a big Clubhouse user, and and 
I, I've gone in there once or twice a week for a little while, but it's been a couple of weeks since I've been in there. So my thoughts are, will Clubhouse make it in the long term? Steven already touched on some of these. So first, I'm going to say maybe it could be bought out by an existing social media hub that did not create their own Clubhouse like environment. Most of them have their own Clubhouse environments. I don't know how the, if those Clubhouse like environments in these different uh, social media platforms, if they're if it's going to exist for the long term or not. I mean, let's face it, it's resources that needs to go into maintaining that. So I don't know if they're going to exist a year from now or not. Maybe Clubhouse will find new life later this year when the school year starts or bad weather, uh, the winter weather starts in the northern hemisphere. Stephen kind of mentioned that as well. Uh, and maybe it will become more of an international chat room hub. I know it had an international focus to begin with. I mean, one of the first clubs I went into was all about the um, the animal rights and, and the conservancy of the environment in Africa. So it was just a bunch of people networking to do that for Africa all over the world. So I know it was international, but for podcasting, it was mainly talked about in North America, at least that's what my perception of it was. So if it gets more of an international flavor, yeah, maybe. And it could be data. It could be large pieces of distance in between people like in Australia. You know, it may, I, I don't know why, but those are some things that it could make it with Clubhouse in the long term. Uh, there were some benefits with the technologies here with Clubhouse, with podcasting. Um, it did bring communities together and not just Clubhouse, but like Blab and other similar sorts of flash in the pan technologies. They bring communities together that maybe wouldn't have found each other otherwise. You know, you you might have heard about somebody, but you never actually got to meet them or listen to them or watch them. And so these technologies like Clamor, Blab and uh, the Clubhouse, it, it, these technologies can bring communities together and people together that wouldn't have normally found each other. It, you can delve into these as they come up and enjoy the departure from the status quo operating environment for a little bit. But just keep in mind that return of investment that I was talking about earlier. And if you're not getting anything out of it, it was just cricket. If there's nobody there, then why are you there? Right? Just go back to your long-term strategies after that. And by embracing these a little bit when they come out, or at least testing the waters, these new technologies, it could bring in new ways to broadcast your content. Like with Blab, for me personally, one of the things that I, I wasn't going to do is broadcast video for like Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. and Starling Tribune. And Blab made that possible. Blab started me along the path of, hey, I can produce this content. So, yes, uh, there was some good that came out of Blab for me personally, but it's not something that I would have kept on for long time. I mean, the, the place was almost crickets by the end anyway. And then talking about that, here's some cautions of flash in the pan technologies for podcasting for uh, these apps like Blab, Clamor, and for Clubhouse. No when to say when. Don't waste your time with little to no return of investment or return on investment. If you happen to build a big audience in these technologies as they come up and go down, they might not know where to find your show out of the technology. And that's not necessarily that they don't know the name of your show. They don't know your website. They might not know how to consume your normal content. Like if your normal content is a podcast, and yes, we've said on the show that podcasting is becoming more normal, more mainstream. Still, there are people out there that just don't get it. So if they find you through this app, like Clubhouse, that they got on because there was a work call there and they're like, okay, everybody come here for this uh, all hands meeting or something like that. And then you're on it and you're like, wow, this is pretty neat. And they find you and, and your content on there, but then the technology collapses eventually and they don't know where to find you. It, it, ha it happens. So audiences ebb and flow with this sort of thing. So is it worth your time to do it? And uh, be prepared to recognize the FOMO, the fear of missing out. It might make you invest time and energy that you should be spending on core content creation. Like you just want to use this new technology, but you're not really focusing on creating new content or good content or something like that. That should always be your focus is creating good content and then take advantage of these other ways to communicate or distribute. 
as they come along and as you have available time, but don't make it your focus. And as a caution, some platforms have been known to use bots to artificially inflate member numbers and room attendance or their, uh, their listening to your content or something like that. I will cite Clamor for that. There was, it never failed. Yeah, I put a Clamor out and there would be one or two accounts from a totally different demographic that shouldn't have been listening to it or care about it whatsoever with these stock photos on it that just showed up. They were just bot accounts. And it's like, uh, I, I don't want bot accounts. I want real people. I want real engagement. So just be prepared to realize that some startup technologies do use that technique. I'm not saying all of them do, but I do know that some of them do. Which uh, is what I did with Better Podcasting, by the way. We've never actually had any real listeners or viewers. Everybody that I've ever cited has been a fake count that I made, SP. Wow. I'm, well, I'm very impressed because, therefore, one of your fake accounts has announced at the Olympics with Jason Bryant. Mm. You know, I, I go the extra mile for you, SP. Wow, that's a lot of work. And the final thing I want to say in terms of a caution is if a new technology is receiving hype, you need to analyze it. And is it because it fills the need or because there is a deal made with a few influential people and maybe they're just trying to hype it up for a little bit and, and get everybody on board. And then you're on that crest train that gets in there, but then it dies off. And there are technologies out there that have stood the test of time. Uh, TikTok is an example that's been around for a little bit. Now, everybody thought it was going to die because multiple issues. I won't go into it, but TikTok is around and thriving today still after a couple of years. So that's an example of a technology that's made it. So you just need to ascertain whether this clubhouse thing, is this really going to work or is it going to fall flat? Blab, is this really going to work or is it going to fall flat? Clamor. I love the capability with Clamor. It took a lot uh, more time in it than not, but was it worth my time in the end? I don't think so. I, I think in the grand scheme of thing, Blab, it's probably more worth my time just because the benefits that that came out of it than Clamor or Clubhouse would have been for us. So this is just a, a commentary on these flash in the pan technologies and just make your own decisions on whether you want to use it or not. And just wanted to let everybody know why we weren't really talking about Clubhouse as we had concerns with the technology. This is where we here at Better Podcasting turn the show over to you as we run through some of your feedback. We call this segment Better Podback. Let's talk about the wonderful Damien the DM. He's always on top of this stuff here. In our Discord server this past week, Damien the DM said, quote, so Zoom just announced a new USB condenser mic. This was the setup they went for with their promo video, end quote. And what he posted was a picture of people using this USB condenser microphone to do, I guess, a podcast. And I know that we do have a video side of things, but I will describe it because, we, you know, we, we, it's easier for me to describe it than it is to actually go and put it on screen in video. And so... Here's, here's what it is. You see a couple of people in a living room. For some reason, one of them has like a director's chair in the background, but that's beside the point. And they're both on chairs at a table. And the podcaster seems to be sitting there with her laptop in front of her and the microphone is on the table. Well, it is, I would say, probably... Well Four feet, five feet. I was going to say, it's about four or five feet away from her. Yeah. But here, here's the thing. It's actually, I, I would go more around three feet away from her. However, she's also sitting with a gentleman that is holding his guitar. Because again, all podcasts seem to have have uh, music guests. That seems to be the, the go-to with podcasts. It's, it's an acoustic guitar. It, it's not electric. It is an acoustic guitar. And he has his headphones. And he is probably about five to six feet away from said microphone. And well, he's definitely taller. So he, he, you know, there's yeah. an added height there. Yeah. So basically, they've done what we've always talked about, which is grabbing a condenser microphone, shoving it on a table and sitting way back so that you get all of this echo. And so you're saying, Stephen, how do you know there's going to be echo in this room? Number one, because it doesn't matter what room you're in unless it's like super acoustically treated. When you shove a microphone in the middle of a table, you will have echo. But if that's not enough, behind the gentleman with the guitar, you can see a very 
hard wall that right beside him is brick fireplace. Well, but on the wall, there's a, well, I, I, I think it's pictures, but it, it looks like, like one of those wall happy birthday signs. I think that's acting as the acoustic treatment on that wall back there. <laughs> that's right. I, I forgot that putting up a piece of paper on your wall is exactly the acoustic treatment that we all need. Ha, I, nobody needs sound tiles. Just put up happy birthday banners behind you. That might actually, if you put enough of them no. or, uh, you know, no. in your ceiling to no. act as baffles. If they're hanging down, maybe you'd get a little bit, but mm. anyway. Not against the wall. Yeah. So, so that, that's apparently what they decided to do in this promo video. Um, I just think that like, this is another example on how Zoom is, is off base. I think with their marketing team, as far as promotions go for new podcast uh, products, this is not the first time we've ridiculed sort of their their promotional elements of their products that they put out because I think they are mi missing the fact that there are a lot of people that are educated in things like this. We're not the only one that gives advice on not shoving a microphone on a table and sitting away from it. it it's just the, the reality is that's a big part of advice because people are trying to break years of habits that came from, you know, 10 year old ago technology. And it's becoming a lot easier to have multiple people with multiple mics with microphones that are coming out that are cheaper and cheaper. So I, I think that this is just another example on that. But also, I think it's an example on why we're not raking in the big money on better podcasting. We're not having a guy come in and play his guitar or having a girl come out and sing us a, a lyric, a, a song like the last Zoom promo video. Well, I expect next time we podcast that you learn how to play the acoustic guitar and then you play it for us. Yeah. So I, I think that's definitely what we need to do. And for those that are watching us on Twitch or YouTube, you can see the picture that Steven is talking about. This is the promo that Zoom put out for their new microphone. Steven, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something a little controversial here, for, even for us. Uh-oh. Yeah. I'm going to say that instead of spending all the money zoom and putting that usb microphone on there with uh whatever headphone amplifier that is and anything i'm saying take your phone put it on the table maybe maybe even put it on a cloth so you're insulating from you know bumps on the table and you use your phone to record the audio i bet you the audio coming from that is going to be way better than the audio coming from what you're seeing on there uh, cause the phone has the, you know, the automatic, uh, reverb, deverb capability. It has some, uh, audio cancellation in it. And even though you're not going to get a true recording, it's going to sound better than that. I look forward to you putting this experiment through its paces. All right, here we go. <laughs> Uh, we also had a message in our Discord from Jonas Badger that, uh, he said, quote, I'm wait wanting to start a network of audio dramas. How does one successfully go about creating a podcast network? End quote. Now, this is something that we're not going to answer right here right now. It's a big conversation, but I wanted to highlight it right now because we do have people who listen to this show who have started podcast networks. I would love it if you could drop by our Discord and give Jonas Badger some advice. Come to betterpodcasting.com slash Discord. You know, I'd love it if you stayed, but he, even if you come in, you drop the advice and you leave. I just would love it if you you could give him some advice or send it to us to podcast at betterpodcasting.com. We'll pass that along and uh, maybe even talk about it on a future episode. But I do know there's lots of people or multiple people, I should say, that have started a podcast that listen to this show, a podcast network. And I'll just put a plug in too. If you actually have an audio drama and you want to be part of a podcast network, you hit him up on our Discord server at John S. Badger. He has the audio drama that I had a voiceover in, a couple of voiceovers in now. And uh, I, I think he's doing a lot of great work. He's got a lot of great talent there, uh, both in voiceover and story. So uh, I, I can see his point. And there's only so much that one person can produce. So if you coalesce a, a network of similar type shows, in this case, audio dramas, I think that would be great. I think John's got a good idea. but. 
at the same time, there's a lot of uh, pitfalls that come with starting a mm. network. And, and I will echo what you just said. Uh, make sure that you come in and give him your advice or give it to us so we can pass it along. Yeah, he's doing great things and things just keep getting better and better over there. We also wanted to quickly mention here, and this isn't feedback, but I'm sure we could turn it into some, um, is that FaceTime, Apple FaceTime, is rolling out a new option that is going to work a little bit like Zoom. And this is where I'm soliciting for feedback on this. So basically, they are making it so that people with Android and Windows devices are going to be able to join a FaceTime call. Now, it's not going to be like we all wish, where there's an app on Windows or there is an app on Android. From what they're saying, they are looking to do like Zoom, like Teams, like WebEx, like all of those things where somebody creates a video link and then sends it over to others and people join that. And the reason I wanted to bring this up is because I do think that there's going to be some some investigation that us podcasters need to look into on this because there are lots of people that use Zoom to podcast and connect with people. I'm looking forward to seeing this. I don't own an Apple phone, but I'm sure at some point we'll have SP generate a link for me to join and we'll test the audio quality through this or or something like that because in theory, I should be able to join that FaceTime using my current equipment. So or I really do want to know what people think about this. And I think also it might be actually a lot easier for some people to get guests using FaceTime. So I think there's a lot of potential that could come out of this, even in like for podcasting in the state that it is. Now, for re like, you know, traditional FaceTime use, I got a whole other rant about this, but I will save that from this podcast because I do think that this has potential for podcasters. And if you're listening to this and you use FaceTime to podcast or want to use FaceTime to podcast, please let us know. We really would uh, like your feedback on that. Neither of us use FaceTime to podcast for a variety of different reasons, but uh, we want to hear your experiences. So that's going to go ahead and wrap it up for this episode. Before we go, I want to remind everybody, uh, as I said at the top of the show, we have Better Podcasting Live Chat. We'd love to have you subscribe to that show. It is in a separate feed. Also, we do have the Gunna Geek Network that we're a part of. If you want to check out some other geeky content, you can go ahead and check that out at gunnageek.com. As well, just got to say, if you need a translation from old people speak, SP is your guy. Go ahead and get in touch with him at betterpodcasting.com slash discord. I'll ask my kids what it means and I'll <laughs> get back to you. That's how that happens. Oh, by the way, before we leave, I just want to say I was on a couple of episodes of people in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, Josh Liston with his Dead Set Podcasting. I was on and we were talking about microphones and stuff. So you can go get that at Dead Set Podcasting. And then also Heather Welsh now has the Not Just Heather podcast. And I had the honor to be on an episode of that. So you can check both those out, a New Zealand podcast, an Australian-based podcast, and uh, you can get all your lovable SP on those. But really, I want to highlight those two individuals, Heather and Josh. They do amazing stuff, and I'm glad that they asked me, and I'm very honored that they asked me to be on their shows. So for episode number 252 of Better Podcasting, I'm Stephen John Drew saying... I think that I'm going to be having SP do a lot of translation for me from Young People Talk because he's all hip in the club. And I'm SP saying, uh, Jason Bryant, I want to hear your best bee boop boop impression. Bye. Bye. Thanks for checking out another episode of Better Podcasting. You can find the full back catalog of Better Podcasting at betterpodcasting.com. If you're into geeky podcasts, please check out the other podcasts on the Gunna Geek Network at gunnageeknetwork.com. This show was produced and edited by Stephen John Drew of Gunna Geek Productions. Voice work was done by L.W. Salinas. Thanks again for listening or watching, and we hope to see you again next week.